It's a very special pleasure tonight for me to get a chance to introduce um, the gentleman who's going to share with us a lot of his wisdom about um, the lasting impact of uh, the Mullen Trail and a lot of history probably that we haven't um, unearthed. And um, Greg DeMontier is, of course, a very noted part of the Flathead Reservation. And he's lived there, I believe, for most of his life, if not all of his life. But uh, Greg came to me, as many uh, of my friends do, through uh, connections. And I know there are many, many connections in this room. Um, I met, I've met probably in my life, besides my husband, two other really significant men who uh, impacted me in some way that uh, caused me to kind of change my life interests and my patterns. And one of them was Louis Adams. And if any of you know Louis, you know why. Um, Louis is probably one of the most remarkable Salish elders that have come down uh, that river in quite a while. And um, I fortunately not only got to meet Louis, but I got to have a lot of experiences in the wild with Louis because he accompanied my students and I in so many really significant sites all over Montana. He took us to the top of Nesper's Pass where we honored his uh, great, great, great grandfather who passed away in, I think, 1809 or 1811. At the top of Nez Perce Pass, they finally buried him because he had been on a, a hunt over in Idaho, and when he was coming back over Nez Perce Pass, um, he couldn't, his body couldn't stay on the horse any longer, and so they buried him in a wooded spot at the top of Nez Perce Pass. Louis took my students and me there to that site uh, one beautiful spring afternoon and Kim Brigham was with us. And I think Kim will attest to this that it was probably one of the most moving experiences any of those students that were with us or Kim or I ever had because um, there were uh, part of um, Louis' family along, and I believe Myrna was there at that time too, singing honor songs across those mountains to this great, great, great grandfather who had passed so many years before. Louis took us to the Jocko Cemetery. I don't know how many of you have been there, but it's an incredible place that uh, holds the graves of so many people we've talked about in the last couple of days. Unbelievable place to take kids Talk about primary source documents, Tom. <laughs> Incredible. Um, he took us inside the church and told us so many stories. At any rate, um, he also took us to Council Grove, which we'll hit tomorrow with Greg and Myrna. But along the way, I met Myrna. And Myrna is Louie's oldest daughter, and she became a close friend of mine. And so when Kim came to me and asked me to be a part of this committee, and we started chatting about who we could have with a native voice that could come and speak to us. We met Myrna for coffee downtown at uh, a coffee shop. And when we sat her down, she said, you don't want me for this event. You want my husband. I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> and so then we got a chance to meet Greg, and we discovered why we wanted him for this particular event. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Greg, and then I'm going to get off the microphone and let him begin, because he's ready to go. Um, Greg is, um, let's see, he's a member, of course, of the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribe. He has 40. 40 years of experience in public administration and business development. Um, he has had a lifelong pursuit of Salish culture and oral history for many tribal elders. And as a public administrator, Greg served in health and human services, human resources, public administration, public information, tribal government, and he was an executive administrator there. Um, under the business and economic development, Greg was a founder, 
the founder and the president of SK Technologies. And if you live anywhere near here, you know what that means. Greg loves ranching and currently lives in Valley Creek just outside our Lee. He works with a nonprofit he recently created to promote, again, like Trina, to promote entrepreneurial development in rurally economically depressed areas. <clears throat> Hold on just a minute. I skipped a little bit of my speech here. And I want to make sure that I cover it. Greg also developed SK Technologies into one of the top 100 federal IT contractors in the entire United States. Greg's the recipient of a 2008 SBA, I assume that's Small Business Administration, Region 8 Entrepreneurial Success Award, and he was elected chairman of the Native American Contractors Association. He served as a business consultant to many tribally owned corporations, and he believes in the infusion of eco-friendly practices and emerging technological industries in government and business. Without further ado, Greg, the man. Well, good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. I, I have kind of a soft voice, so I'd like to tell you I make up for it by having a strong message, but it gets kind of soft there, too. So uh, in the introduction, it got me to thinking about Louis Adams and, you know, one, one, one of my elders. And as you know, I married his daughter. But just to tell a quick story about what kind of a man Louis was, uh, he named me, um, um, and that means walks in the sky. And I thought that was pretty cool that, that, that he would honor me with that kind of a name. And of course I was married to his daughter. And then I learned what he named his daughter, Chocho Shasket. That means hollers to the sky. So I'm walks in the sky and my wife is hollers to the sky and both came from Louis Adams. So that tells you probably just about everything you need to know about his outlook on life, his sense of humor and uh, how we wove everything together. So uh, with that, I wanna start with something that I'm kind of uncomfortable doing uh, and that's talking about myself. Um, and the reason I'm uncomfortable doing that is because it's uh, it, it's it's hard to 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 be raised the way that I was raised to be told the things that I've been told by elders to stand in front of a group of people as a Salish man and boast or to talk about yourself in that way. Um, so the the. The idea is to be humble. That's a core principle, tribal value. But my message tonight, it's important that you understand a little bit about my background because it shapes the way that I see the world and shapes um, part of the message that I'm gonna share with you tonight. So I was born in St. Ignatius 69 years ago today. Yep. Thank you. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> so my father was born in the same hospital a few years before that. My grandfather was born in St. Ignatius before that. My great-grandfather was born in the Stevensville area. And that's far, as far back as I can go uh, on, on the Salish side. On my mother's side, my mother was born in Polson, Montana. Her parents were homesteaders to the reservation. She was non-tribal. 
So I was raised from a mother and a non-tribal family, a father and a tribal family in the 50s and the 60s in western Montana. I developed some fairly early notions about how the world worked, right? And to this day, I carry some of those things with me. But I, I thought it was important for you to know that. Uh, and besides, I'm, I'm kind of proud to say, you know, with that kind of heritage, a man just can't get much more Montana than that, right? <laughs> so so at, at a fairly early age, I learned the difference between tribal and non-tribal at a time when, to me, it was all one world because it was, it was my family's. Now, we had Thanksgivings and Christmases totally separate. San Ignatius and Polson, Montana are 30 miles apart, but they may have been 3,000 miles apart the way things were dealt with. There was never any crossover, any, any exchange uh, between the families other than us. Um, uh, with, you know, with, with, uh, I have an older sister and a younger brother. So in that period of time, in, I, 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 by the time I was about 15, I started to understand that the world I was living in, both tribal and non-tribal, was not a common experience, right? I thought everybody was sort of that way. And then I kind of looked around and realized, no, people aren't that way. I, I have a fairly unique upbringing. So by the time I was about 15, one of the things that I realized is that on the tribal side of my family, I was very readily accepted as a person. And, and the values uh, and the love and the caring that came from that were, were very open and very comforting to me. On my mom's side of the family, they loved me, they respected me, but it was a little further away. There was never that embrace, never that warmth that I felt from the tribal side of the family. And for that reason, probably the most compelling reason, I decided that when I was going to pursue a career, I was going to pursue a career on the tribal side because that side of me was one that I was just hungry to learn more about, to, to, to live uh, in, in, in that part of the world uh, and, and focus on that because it was on the non-tribal side of things, everybody was doing pretty well. They were taking good care of themselves and it was in the schools and on TV and everything. And on the tribal side, it was almost silent. You, you know, you hardly ever see a tribal person on TV in the, in the 60s and the 70s. You see some Italians. But, but not tribal people. So I decided then uh, that I was going to focus my work uh, within tribal government uh, to, to try to help tribal people. My career there started in 1976. So it's been a little more than 40 years now. But one of the very first things that I did is read a piece of legislation that was brand new from Congress. Public Law 93638. And in that legislation, right up front, was something called congressional findings, right? The legislation starts with congressional findings. In other words, this is why as Congress, we think this should be done, right? One of the congressional findings said, federal domination of programs serving Indian people serves to retard rather than enhance the development of Indian people. I read that and I was hooked. I thought, holy smokes, Congress is saying this, <laughs> right? So I took a look at that legislation and I immediately started pushing within our tribe to do something with that, with that legislation. And as a result of that, in the fall of 1976, my first job with the tribe was managing a Self-Determination Act contract for the tribe's 
which could very well, as I'm finding out later in life, could very well have been the very first one in the United States. And it was in Indian education at the elementary and secondary level. And that's where I started. Fast forwarding through the years, being a proponent of self-determination, our tribe grew from just a handful of employees down at the Dixon Agency in old cobbled up BIA buildings to the complex that you see up there in Pablo right now from a handful of employees to well over a thousand. And that happened actually in the first eight years. So by 1984, our tribe had become very, very large. So at that time, since I had been a proponent of taking on federal programs, doing 638 contracting, which is what fueled that growth, and the tribal council sat there suddenly with a thousand employees with an organization chart that looked like the tribal council down to a line that goes from wall to wall with 44 different programs and departments. So they called me up and said, in my words, not theirs, all right, hotshot, you thought this was such a great idea, get up here and help us figure out a way to be able to manage this better, right? So um, I, I started working in tribal administration and reorganized tribal government um, and spent about 10 years there. And by the time I was oh, about 20 some years uh, into, my, into my tribal experience, one of the things that occurred to me is that we were getting pretty good in government services, natural resources management. Uh, we, we had culture committees established uh, to preserve the language and the culture. We had health programs, education programs, of course, on and on and on. But everything we did from a business standpoint sucked, okay? And, and I, I read every annual report and every tribal council minutes of their meetings going all the way back to 1935 when, when, when our tribe was organized. And I came to this realization. Every single year for every single business that the tribe ran going back to 1934 lost money each and every year. So I thought, okay, we need to do something about this. So that's when I formed SNK Technologies. <clears throat> and I, I kind of almost had to trick the tribal council into it because if I would have walked in there and said, you know what, I'm gonna start an informa information technology and aerospace company. And we're gonna work with the Department of Defense and NASA and uh, you know, work all over the world. They would have looked at me and said, you know, you really ought to think about a 12-step program, right? So. <laughs> So anyway, uh, but, but I kind of tricked him into it by talking one of their other companies into fronting the money for it um, and uh, uh, then paid them back. S&K Technologies took off. So I have a government background. I have a business development background. And underneath all of that, beginning at a very early age, I've been very culturally, ins culturally sensitive, if you will and aware of conflicting cultures that, that were a part of my life. So this is the Mullen Road Conference. <laughs> you were wondering how I was gonna get back around to that, weren't you? Is this gonna go on all night? No. <clears throat> so during that period of time in the 1850s, when, when uh, the, the Mullen Road was, was originally being surveyed, what was going on? What was going on in the two worlds, if you will? Because the Mullen Road became a very strong connection between those two worlds. Now, I didn't say a good connection. I didn't say a bad connection. I said a strong connection. And, and that, that's important. I'm going to get back to that uh, in, in a little while. But the road was made in response to 
Indian uprisings, if you will, right? Military at that time was taking a look at a supply chain from Fort Benton to Walla Walla that went around South America, right? I mean, it's, it, there's got to be a better way, right? So, no one go out there and figure out a road to get right through there because we need to supply our military operations. Stemming basically from the right campaign, which I understand everybody has, has talked about a little bit earlier today. They're saying for me to move the mic closer to you there, Greg. Oh. Right under my chin. All right. If, you, if, you're, if, you're, if my voice starts to fade and you're not hearing me, just, just raise your hand and, and uh, you know, or throw something at me or, you know, whatever. So, uh, at any rate, um, the, the, the right campaign and the um, Indian uprising, as, as it's referred to, or the conflicts, the inherent conflicts between tribal and non-tribal people uh, had erupted. Uh, and there was a need to provide a supply chain for that. Uh, and the reason I say it that way is because I made a lot of money for my tribe doing supply chains for the United States Air Force all over the world. I know how the military thinks, and if they have an operation going on somewhere and they don't have a short supply chain to it, they're gonna have trouble and they're gonna try to solve that problem. So that's why I believe that this was a supply chain issue. Uh, Fort Walla Walla as a direct result of the right campaign and the animosities and the skirmishes that were taking place uh, as a result of that. But let's talk a little bit about those skirmishes and what was going on during the 1850s, right? That was a treaty period, right? That's, you know, parties coming together and hammering things out on table and working everything out, right? So what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the conflict about? What's the, what's the trouble about? So, in my view, in taking a look at that, in taking a look at, at two cultures, I want to talk about those two cultures in, in that were out here in this area during that period of time. First, the non-tribal culture, manifest destiny, right? Westward ho. In my view, that was driven economically. It was opportunity that people were taking a look at. They were looking at ways to be able to make a living. Larger corporations were interested in expanding their railroads, were interested in, in, in building, if you will, a thriving economy. Because corporations back then are really driven on the same principles, driven by the same principles as corporations today. In order to reach a pinnacle, you need to have a very solid base of operations. The higher the pinnacle, the broader the base. In order to have a broad economic base, you need land. You need people. You need diversity. You need to expand, okay? Manifest destiny. You have to have that broad base in order to fill those things. So how successful was it? Enter Teddy Roosevelt. Right at the turn of the century in the 1900s. What's he perhaps most famous for? Not that, not the National Bison Range that he took from us. What, 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 I'll circle back to that one, but that's a rabbit hole. I'll try not to go down that one. He was a trust buster. J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, Carnegie, there's three individuals almost ran the country. Arguably, they did run the country, right? That happened because the engine was fueled by tribal land by tribal opportunities. It worked, in other words, for them, <laughs> at least three individuals, but it didn't work for people as a whole, which is why Teddy Roosevelt said, we need to bust these large corporations up into smaller pieces, so kind of flatten it out, if you will, 
um, and, and to not have a detrimental reliance on three individuals. Right? So that was Manifest Destiny, a, a, a strong economic interest, a successful economic interest that was fueled in a large part by what was, up until that point in time, tribal resources, tribal land. Now let's jump over to the tribal side. Because tribes didn't really see this bare land. They didn't look at it from an ownership standpoint. They looked at it as something that was provided to them. I think you've all heard the adage that, that we, did, we didn't inherit from our ancestors. We're borrowing it from our future generations, right? That's, that's a, a core principle, if you will, uh, behind a lot of tribal values. The other one that goes with that is you never take anything more than you need. The Creator blessed us with the land, blessed us with everything that's on the land. Our use of that, again, we don't own it, we use it, we borrow it, is as close as we get to ownership from future generations. We use it very carefully and we use it in a sustainable fashion. If we're taking more than we need, there's gonna be harm that comes from that. And that is a principle that predates climate change and environmental sciences by a couple thousand years. It is a fundamental principle that we are here, that there is great wealth that is provided for us here, but it's not great wealth in worldly terms, it's great wealth in terms of the relationship with people, the relationships among people, the relationships with the Creator, the blessings that the world provides, all of that makes us very wealthy as people. Very wealthy. Money really didn't exist. Materials were traded. There was an economy, if you will, of sorts among tribes. But money and the idea of great wealth was right in the same area as owning the land, owning a corporation, right? It's just foreign concepts. So there you have the setting. Manifest destiny moving in, a tribal approach to life and a tribal economy, right, that meets a very strong economy-driven manifest destiny and what happens? The interests, the interests between the two parties, the interests that are connected by the Mullen Road, by the railroads, by a number of things, those interests that became connected were not in balance. You had a very powerful economic interest and a very small, if you will, relatively speaking, and a totally different value-based economic system. When two things like that are out of balance, what happens is conflict, okay? I don't believe that anybody at that time cared about our culture at all. People weren't after our culture. They weren't after our land. They weren't after what it is that we knew in terms of medicines and so forth and so on. They wanted our resources. That's what they wanted. That's that manifest destiny thing coming in. <clears throat> so I hear a lot of tribal people, and, and, and over the years, um, I've heard of this many times, you know, they took our children and put them in boarding schools. They beat the language out of them. They went straight for our culture. And I said, yeah, but why? Why were they going for the culture? Because if you could get rid of the culture, 
you get the resources, right, that, that the tribal people have. So culture became an impediment or a hurdle to clear, if you will, for manifest destiny. It wasn't the target. It was just simply a step along the way that, that, that needed to be taken. So <clears throat> looking at it then from present day, if you will, I believe that the effects of the Mullen Road in connecting two cultures is still in play today. This isn't just a part of history. This isn't something that just happened way back when and the effects of which have just sort of kind of carried on their own life and are kind of dwindled away, if you will. Those effects of the connection of two different cultures in this area is still unresolved and is still being worked out, okay? So my question, my challenge to you tonight in looking at the history of the Mullen Road and looking at the connections that it created between two people to be able to say at the same time Connections between two different people. That's a good thing. Shouldn't it be? Shouldn't that be a good thing? And at the same time, looking at the history and saying, you know, <clears throat> it, it might not have been that good. So what can we do? It's 1855 all over again, or 1858 all over again. Mullen Road 2.0 in 2023, the connection between two people. It begins, I believe, with understanding the connections that were made, the effects of those connections, by understanding the path that we've been on as people. That path has had its successes it's had its failures. It's had those things that we can honor and those things that we kind of are shameful and, 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 and back away from. And that is both tribal and non-tribal, okay? We're people. We are all people. And regardless of the culture that we come from or the language that we speak, we're more the same than we are different. And a lot of that that's the same is that we can be pretty impish at times, kind of foolish at times, and we can get ahead of ourselves and get greedy and get just downright foolish and make big mistakes, okay? That's just part of, of who we are as people. The challenge that we have is how do we learn from that, not just learn the activities and the events, around the Mullen Road or the 1860s, but to understand what's underneath that and how we are still a part of what was started back then. And that we need to do something with that if we believe in handing to our future generations an understanding, a harmony, a way of being able to live together, to work together, to respect each other, to resolve those things. It's our responsibility, I believe, in this generation. And when I say this generation, I mean anybody within 20 years older than me or 50 years younger, right? We have an unprecedented ability to build connections. Internet. Where'd my phone go? Thompson, did you take my phone? Oh, no. All right, here it is. Unbelievable knowledge, right, at, at, at the fingertips now. And even kids are carrying these things around. We have the ability to be able to collect billions and billions 
of pieces of data. The challenge that we have is how to connect those dots. We connect with each other. We connect a lot of information through these devices, using that to create a better understanding, a more purposeful understanding, is what our challenge is. And the Creator has given us the tools that we need to do that. Events such as this, tools such as this, hearts that we all have. You all care. You all care. You wouldn't be here. You care about what has gone on. You care about history. You care about the story of people in that history because you care about people. So on the tribal side, you may not sense that you're very welcome at times because of some of the anger and some of the frustrations, the historical trauma, as it's referred to, and I don't mean to make little of that, but it is right there in, in, in front of everybody. But few people, including tribal people, want to recognize the effects of that historical trauma and, and how it affects our behaviors today. But we can get there. We can, we can do that, and I believe that we have a responsibility to do that, given the experiences collectively that we have, given the tools that, that this age has brought to us, and given the people that we are at, at, at this time. Um, to, to resolve those things, to take a look at a future, one that is based on purpose, not just profit, right? One that is based on a collective wisdom from two cultures, not the subjugation of one by the other. That sounds kind of, uh, what? What's a good word for that? <laughs> Almost naive. Almost naive, but look where I came from. Look at the way that I was raised in these two worlds. That gap is more feared than it is wide. Okay? So we can, we can overcome that. We can build a new road. Mullen 2.0 can be a reality. Or we can just care about something else and let history repeat itself, right? I mean, isn't that the reason that we study history and want to do a deep dive into history so that we don't just repeat it, we get smarter? That's what we need to do in this little part of the world. So. Um, I guess I just have one more thought that I, that I didn't um, um, stress adequately, I guess. I said that we're people first, all of us are people first, yeah, and I believe that. But we need to take a good, close look at what we create as people. And I'm talking about tribal and non-tribal. What do we create? We, can, we both create government infrastructures. Hell, I designed one for the tribe. And I studied a lot of what the United States governmental infrastructure is all about. We create governmental infrastructures as people. We also create corporate infrastructures, whether it is a ma and pa shop or it's AT&T, right? They're all basically built on the same, the, the same principles, and the idea is that they're there to do business. 
But those are the two principal infrastructures that, that, we, that we build as people. We can build them differently. We can build them uh, with different perspectives. But there is one fundamental that, that I think we can all agree on. All of us, at one point in time, work for one of them. Okay? We're either working on the business side or we're working on the governmental side or we're working on both. Um, but we, we, we work for them. But the purpose of those institutions that we construct is to serve us as people. We work for the things that are supposed to serve us. So that's not who we are. We are not corporations. We are not government infrastructure. We are not Democrats. We are not Republicans. We are people. Those are the constructs that we put together in order to get through in this life, right? In order to sustain ourselves. So we often, as a result of that, we, we, we have a habit of ascribing values and principles to those infrastructures that are pretty lofty and sound pretty good, right? I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're well intended. But when it gets time to operating those infrastructures, the day-to-day -day management of those infrastructures, not the design of them, not the vision, not the mission, right? But the daily operation of it, that's where we tend to get into trouble, both tribal and non-tribal. We tend to lose sight of those fundamental principles. The idea of serving people, the idea of bringing people together, the idea of you name it. I mean, isn't that what government is supposed to do is bring people together? How well is that working for us? Right? I mean, it's, it's at times I think it's a lot easier to overcome Indian, non-Indian conflicts than it is Democrat and Republican conflicts because one is based on a misunderstanding and the other is based on competing ideologies, right? So those are things that, that we can do. Those are things that, that, that we have to do. I'm sensitive to the fact that the Mullen Road is often viewed by tribal people as being a source of conflict, that it created a, an avenue, if you will, for a change of life that was not welcome, for effects on our country that were not welcome. But the Mullen Road didn't do that. It connected two people, two groups of people. It's the people that did those things subsequent to that. Not the road, it's the people. So what I pray for and what I ask for and what I'd like to leave you with here tonight is we, we understand the conflicts of the past, right? And, and to the degree that we can broaden our understanding of those conflicts is the same degree to which we can, beginning tonight, move forward and take a look at this beautiful country that's all around us and all of us as beautiful people that are living in it and saying, is this the best we can do? Is this what we want our children to inherit? No, let's, let's resolve those things now. Let's, let's, let's resolve those things while we have all of the tools and all of the opportunity and all of the hearts that we need to be able to do that. Let's not kick that can down the road to another generation. We can do that. So tonight, that's my challenge to you. Uh, that's my perspective. And growing up on both sides, 
obviously I have a, a personal vested interest in having both sides get along, right? It would sure make family reunions a lot easier, right? But but it, it's something that I something that I really believe in, and something that I just I really can't wrap my minds around. A lot of people um, are very quick to say some of my best friends are Indians, you know, and I'm sure they are, right? But when's the last time you heard somebody say, "Gee, I like that tribal government," right? You just that's you know. That's a construct of, of what tribal people put together. And it is feared by non-tribal people. It is feared by the state of Montana, by Missoula County commissioners. Well, not so much the county commissioners are warming up to it right away. But at any rate, th those, those, those understandings and those fears right, are, are tied together. The broader the understanding, the less fear there is. The less fear there is, the more heart there is, the more we can we, we, we can we can get along. So that's uh, that's why I'm before you with a corporate background, with a governmental background, and with a tribal and non-tribal background. All the pieces are there, right? I just need you to help me pull them all together. So thank you all for listening tonight. Thank you all for spending the time to, to learn something about the past. That's, that's going to pay dividends, I'm, I'm convinced. So uh, if there's anybody that has any questions, um, please feel free at this point in time. I'm not sure. It's 8.09, so I haven't gone down too many rabbit holes. Uh, anything? <laughs>
And yet at the same time, and I guess I shouldn't be surprised, because the rest of our society is so polarized, it also seems like the tensions have risen at the same time. And I'm wondering how we get past that. So, and I'm not sure you have an answer, because I'm not sure any of us do. What I wanted to do is come here tonight with, with, with some ideas, if you will. Uh, I hold them as answers. I, I, I give them to you as an idea for you to evaluate and to weigh on your own, right? But, two sets of interests, right, can come together, but when they are imbalanced, what comes out is Conflict. Okay? So you're speaking to the conflict of a handgun coming out onto the power, right? Uh, in response to my uh, so in that particular sense, the interests that, that are in play are very much in conflict over who should have the say about who can go where, right? So what do we need to do in order to bring those interests in balance? As, as tribes in coming up with the regulations, we need to understand from the people that we sell those permits to, their experience, their, their thoughts, their, their, you know, uh, and not just do it from the standpoint of what is all around. You taught us this, right, man? We can do whatever it is we want to. So here's the permit, here's the fee. Pay it and shut up. Because we've been doing it for paying you for the last hundred years. That's not going to create what, what needs to happen, right? So in 19... I'm going to try to come up with the right date. Anybody remember when Mark Roscoe was the governor of Montana in one of his last few years? In the 90s? So, in, in, in Polson, the very issue that he's talking about in terms of recreation permits, hunting and fishing in the reservation, and so forth and so on, um, that, the, the, the tribes were standing up at that point in time and saying, here are the rules and regulations for hunting and fishing in the Flathead Reservation. Your state license isn't going to work here anymore, right? People in Pulse are just nuts, right? Start slamming guns out on the counters and you know, doing whatever. Mark Roscoe, in a Pulse public meeting, said one of the things that has struck me as being one of the wisest things that has been said in front of a very, very angry audience like that. And being governor of the state of Montana and being in a conflict between tribal and non-tribal people about hunting and fishing, he began his talk with these words. The law is not as you understand it. Right? And he was right. Once people started to understand the law, the interests started to become more in balance. And the conflict started to go away. And it's been pretty smooth sailing for the last 20 years or so. Until recently, when there was a price hike for a product. And then, right, then the Santa Monica comes up. And, and again, it's, it's, it's the same thing. What we need to learn as tribal people is that if our actions are not understood, and there are conflicting or competing interests that are not tended to, conflict's going to happen, and nobody's going to benefit from that. So the approach, whether it is fish and game, water rights, cultural artifact, repatriation, I should know that. Oh, Indian Child Welfare. Well, I, I should mention the, the handgun, that was probably 1974, so 
our awareness of guns was in pretty different than it is right now, but still, it was a shock. Yeah. So, you know, 1974 was probably was pretty close to the height of the conflicts between tribal and non-tribal people on the reservation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All Citizens Equal, I believe, uh, it's a national organization that's headquartered on our reservation. But, yeah, but, you know, but, but we've learned, I, I, I think, you know, from, from those types of experiences. Um, there is a responsibility on both parties, both relationships, right? I mean, it's just like anybody who's been to marriage therapy, what do you hear? You know, time for you, time for me, time for we, right? And then it comes around to tribal and non-tribal politics, and somehow we lose sight of those fundamentals of relationship building. I don't know, you know, we can do better. We, we, we understand better, but we're not connecting the dots. That's, we need to build those connections. That's why building homes is a good thing. Building connections between people is a good thing. It's where we get out of balance.